I want to begin by introducing people and then subject, if you will permit me. Um, it, is, um, it is one of the nicest things for me that we get to do in this conference from time to time, that we invite the Debian project leader, who this term, in his first term, uh, is Sam Hartman, elected last year as DPL. I love it when the DPL comes to the conference uh, because uh, people whose businesses work extremely hard uh, to distribute software and get it out the door in clean and reliable condition uh, are always a little bit surprised to discover that a community of people operating under conditions of pure democracy and with minimal hierarchy manages to do that for 53,000 packages or so in several different aged versions every year all the time, like slow clockwork. Uh, exposing the DPL to this community is in that sense a window into what it is that we can do that not everybody even knows that we can do. But both panelists today are expert in that. Sam, uh, who uh, is uh, just another part of MIT's contribution to the world of freedom, uh, began working on Kerberos when Kerberos was young and has worked on Kerberos throughout and is uh, therefore responsible for pretty much the only theoretically and practically strong system of high network security for real people to use in the academic and business worlds that anybody ever made. Um, once again, it's important to point out that we were working on solving problems that people didn't know they had yet and Sam's technical career has been about that. Uh, he has been the chief uh, uh, technologist at MIT's uh, Kerberos Consortium from 2002 to 2008 uh, and was then a member of the security uh, team at the Internet Engineering Task Force as its area director in security and now operates the largest invisible software company that makes slow and perfect software in the world. Um, Richard Fontana uh, needs less of an introduction in this room, but I just want to say that when you run a teaching practice, which I do, uh, occasionally you run across a lawyer who comes to work for you who needs no teaching. Uh, Richard uh, was in that condition when he arrived at Software Freedom Law Center in 2006 to work with me on making GPL 3. I discovered that I had a lawyer whose Claim charts were so good that the USPTO would just take them in a re-exam and adopt them wholesale. And a guy who could do what I could not do, which was to keep his temper for 18 months while we made <laughs> GPL3. And he kept his temper with me and with RMS and with the wow. world. And it was a massive achievement, which I could not have taught him. Since then, he has been doing at Red Hat a number of different jobs. Uh, they call him senior commercial counsel, uh, but... That's because I didn't want IP in my title. Yeah, yeah, well, that was a good choice, but it left out the takes care of Fedora, which is a really important part of this story because Richard, too, understands how communities of... I, can't, I, I don't know, can I say about Fedora that is not hierarchical? I, the hidden hand is the only hierarchy in Fedora, let us put it that way. And, and, and Richard has managed both the hidden hand and the beauties of community um, almost uh, at the same level of complexity that Sam has. Um, I wanted to have a conversation about licensing, but I wanted to have it in a slightly different way than we have typically been having it. We are aware that software uh, that we make and uh, whose rules of distribution we have created collectively together, software that we make is now distributed in two quite different ways, uh, which I call fast and slow in the prospectus for this talk, but which we could also call informal and formal. Uh, that is to say, we make distributions that we plan very carefully. 
And Debian is a very carefully planned distribution, which is upstream from a lot of other carefully planned distributions, which rely upon Debian's accuracy and complexity suppression, and which just take it and modify it and share it, knowing that the infrastructure of software distribution underneath is solid and well considered. And we also make an awful lot of workloads in contemporary enterprise computing, which are containers thrown together rapidly and in various lightly disciplined ways and which exist for milliseconds before they are gone forever and replaced by another container, which might look very much the same except is slightly different in ways that nobody is paying much attention to. And we are using the same set of rules the same principles of sharing and notification of rights and collection of material for legal proof of, of freedom to operate and use. And we are using the same rules across that broad spectrum from the most formal and the most planned and the most slowly matured make no software release before its time that we are using for a series of arrangements which are celebrated for their flexibility and ease of multiplication and all of the properties of the modern cloud. It may be that our rules work perfectly across that entire large domain, or perhaps they don't. Perhaps one of the issues we should be thinking about with respect to licensing is how broad the span of distribution styles now is. And that's the conversation that I hope that we can have. But I want to begin by the place I always begin with the DPL. So Sam, tell them what we do and how we do it. So hi, uh, my name is Sam Hartman, and it's a real pleasure to be here. In an alternate universe, I might have been a lawyer. Um, that would have been a universe where the internet had come a few years, or I had come a few, a few years later, and where you could actually do all your legal research online. Libraries frightened me. Like, there were all these books that were really hard to read because I'm blind. Um, so instead, I'm a technologist. And honestly, technology is a lot of fun anyway. Um, and I work with Debian. And, and Debian is a community of, I guess, thousands of people. Uh, we have a formal organization. We have a constitution. And it even has legal existences, although it turns out that's different than uh, the organization uh, through a variety of complex jurisdictional reasons because we're spread all across the world. And one of the biggest things Debian makes is an archive of like 50,000 packages of free software. Um, and another thing we make is the Debian distribution. And actually I'd say that these are um, slightly separate because there are a lot of, um, I think that, the, that one of the values that Debian brings is it brings a curated collection of um, software that we've reviewed the licensing of and that we've thought about how it works together. And what that means is that we start um, typically with an individual going and looking at a piece of software and reviewing the license and typically they review it file by file. And um, look at whether it meets the Debian free software guidelines, which are very similar to the open source definition. Um, you know, the, we, we work very closely with them, um, which are related to the Free Software Foundation's Four Freedoms. Um, and a person reviews the license and thinks about how it fits into the Debian ecosystem, and ultimately someone who's gone through our new membership process brings the software into Debian. And then it gets reviewed by another group of people who also do a license review. Um, and I will admit that for certain large packages like, say, the Linux kernel or Firefox or LibreOffice, I think that perhaps it is not reviewed file by file. There is some review that's done. Uh, but my understanding is that, that there are some, especially for organizations where we trust their upstream review and where their software is very large, we take a slightly different approach. Um, but eventually, by the time software makes its way into Debian, um, multiple people have reviewed it and have said, 
this software actually meets our definition of freedom. And not only is it itself free, but we've confirmed that it doesn't depend on any non-free components. Yes, as Professor Mogul pointed out in the, the opening remarks, we have succeeded in getting everyone interested in at least some of their software being free. We have not succeeded in getting everyone to agree that all of their software could be free. And people play some really interesting games with, um, oh sure, you can get this part free. Of course, it's only useful on our commercial library that you have to pay for. Or, oh sure, we'll be happy to have this infrastructure free so we can build services to lock you in on top of it. And sometimes that's great and sometimes it isn't and Debian has its particular compromises how we do that. And, but we give you, you know, over 50,000 packages that we've actually done that review on. The second thing we do is we take those packages into a stable distribution of Debian uh, that comes out every couple of years and it is a consistent set of those packages that work together, work reliably, uh, and that move very slowly uh, once the stable distribution is released. And it's kind of interesting that I mentioned both of those things separately because different component, different groups of people care about different versions of that. Some people wish, you know, want that really stable version, but some people really actually value um, the fast-moving Debian that is just about the license review. Um, and that's, um, for example, build a distribution on top of Debian that moves as fast as it can given that license review. Um, what's one of the challenges we're facing is that there's so much free software being written these days that even doing that review and getting all the dependencies into Debian is, is enough work that some key packages we'd really love to have in the Debian ecosystem can't be there just because the manpower to, do, to get all the dependencies in and to get the re license review done is more than we can handle. And so there are ways in which even the fast moving side of Debian moves a little bit slower than some people want. That's kind of a brief introduction to where Debian is and where it is, you know, and, and what, what we bring to the world. Um, I guess, you know, I mean, basically it's a, um, volunteers all around the world um, there's a membership process you can go through to become a voting member. There's a lot lighter weight process you can become to, to get packages into Debian. And an even lighter weight process to communicate to the, to um, contribute to the community, suggest changes, suggest, um, work on bugs, participate in our discussions. When we talk about Debian no longer just as the universal operating system, but the universal upstream. What we mean is that there are an awful lot of distributions that use Debian's review and packaging and dependency analysis to found their own, right? Yep. Linux Mint and Ubuntu and a whole lot of other things. Kali, you know, a big one there. The Kali is interesting because they, they are actually one of those really fast moving ones. Like, they actually try and move as fast as they can, sometimes even faster than us. And what do you want to be, Sam? Speaking for the Debian community as a whole, what do you want to be as a manufacturer or distributor of software? Um, so this is something where I think the Debian community is still trying to figure it out. And this is, in my keynote address at our annual conference, I started posing some of these questions. Um, things I know we want to be are we want to drive free software in terms of user freedom forward. Uh, and we want to find a way to continue to be relevant in that way. I know that we continue, that, that our traditional stable releases are critically important to lots and lots of people. There, you know, even in this fast paced world of the cloud, there are cases where you value um, stability. And in fact, you talked about a lot of those, you know, containers that are only going to be around for, um, um, you know, a few milliseconds. A lot of the Docker files that create on the server side, those containers, you know, start with a line that looks a lot like from Debian, um, saying that they're going to start with Debian as a base. 
And even for some of their dependencies, we'll pull it in. And so it's clear that what we've always been doing is still valuable. I think the interesting question is that we're still struggling with. And I, it's not the DPL's job to answer these questions, but more to pose them and to facilitate discussion. And the interesting question is, are there ways that we can better deal with the software that's, you know, so that's hard for us to bring into Debian? Are there ways that Debian can be a better tool for the world of user space containers? Um, can be a better, can citizen in the world where there are packet, where there are language specific repositories? Um, and the world of flat pack and snap and basically all of these technologies that are trying to bring app store like things to the free software world. And how can we do that while actively respecting user freedom rather than just letting this be a way of bypassing user freedom and, and giving um, control to whoever's willing to throw a package out there on the internet. And I think that's the question we're trying to answer. Richard, what is the what is the the informal sector like in that sense? What is the what is the polar alternative to that process of file by file examination and license checking and stable distribution releases for years on end? Well, so the the basic um, problem that I see that that I think is reflected in some of what what Sam was talking about. Uh, initially, is that there's this growing, uh, there's been this growing gap, at least this, this is the point of view, I think, that some of us on the, who kind of work close to Linux distributions, uh, the, way, the way we see it, a, a gap between what developers want and what the makers of distributions uh, want to, to create. So developers um, are you know increasingly impatient with uh, the pace of distributions like Debian or even faster paced ones like uh, Fedora. Um, developers want um, you know often want the latest uh, versions of software. They want software that um, let's assume it's free software or open source, but it it uh, is just not packaged in any distribution, and that's partly an issue of uh, resources, as Sam was saying. Uh, as big a uh, project as Debian is, it can't package everything. Uh, Fedora can't package everything. Red Hat Enterprise Linux can't package everything that developers currently want. There are, um, I don't even know how many, like the um, perhaps hundreds of thousands, uh, maybe, of, of, of packages in certain popular languages that, that are not um, really adequately Packaged um, in these traditional um, Linux distributions that grew up in the you know the 90s and the, the earlier 2000s. So um, developers want a, a kind of more flexible way of getting software. They want to to create complex stacks that may have multiple versions of the same upstream code base. And um, so what developers want is 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 something that looks a lot more in informal in terms of how the stack is kind of created than the, the more sort of uh, uh, streamlined and disciplined sort of system that the distributions uh, worked on creating for, for many years. And in order to make the user space activities packageable, we have devised container formats which layer software on top of other software, which load the same binary in multiple versions uh, through different la layers in the same container. How do we know that there is complete and corresponding source code available for the correct binary that that container actually executes when somebody picks it up and starts running it? How much administrative overhead of that kind will be consistent with the sort of fast moving software that you're talking about. So for some of them, it's pretty easy to know. Um, I've actually seen some you know, blog posts that talk about um, how to construct your, your continuous deployment pipeline for these kind of software stacks. And um, you basically, you end up having testing for that. You, um, you have, for example, there are bots on GitHub
that will go out and look at your dependency stack and open merge requests whenever your dependencies are out of date. Um, and if your test coverage is good enough, you, you can get that. And then other ways you can approach programmatically um, using automation determining that they're, you know, that they're source code and that it's all built. Um, and so it is totally possible for a sufficiently motivated organization um, for a given software stack to do um, a version of that software stack that's excellent from a free software standpoint. And yet, it's also totally possible to go, gosh, I'll just throw this binary blob in here. And the answer is if you're a developer of, the, of, of that stack, you might very well know that what you have is excellent. But the challenge that I don't, that I, where, the reason I think that third party mediaries like distributions um, or something evolved from them have a real place to play is because there are these people other than developers, we call them users. It's their freedom that matters. And right now, they don't necessarily know that some Docker image they're getting or some Python wheel that they're getting gives them all the freedom they want. Um, they don't know that, this, that an NPM package they're getting doesn't have a bug in its minified JavaScript um, that's going to go send their Bitcoin uh, off somewhere they wish it didn't happen. That, that's a very real example that did in fact happen to an unfortunate um, uh, package in that ecosystem. Um, and so, yeah, I, I think that's the, the interesting question is how to get this sort of fast paced stuff, but also to give users guarantees about freedom. Richard? Yeah, so the, the problem uh, that I see uh, with respect to containers and um, uh, specifically, you know, the, the need to have complete corresponding source code is that these um, systems for uh, very conveniently and easily obtaining those, those layers you talked about grew up, uh, were sort of designed and built by um, uh, people, companies that, that were not primarily concerned with um, compliance. So uh, the, the, this technology was popularized um, without, without um, source compliance or, or uh, license compliance in general being a, a primary goal in mind. Whereas I think that one could say that the distributions like, like Debian and, and Fedora grew up with um, license compliance and, and an attention to legal detail as a, as a, uh, as a primary um, objective, um, in addition to you know, wanting to create conveniently consumable software. So there's a, a social and kind of cultural problem that, that um, uh, grew up as uh, containers um, became popularized through, um, you know, basically through, through Docker primarily, initially. And um, uh, so we're kind of we're kind of you know living through that now, and and the the distributions are uh, uh, you know like like Rel and Fedora and Debian um, they they now have a, a a kind of special new role to play in the containerized world because they they um, there's an additional argument for why you should be getting you know building your your container layers from stuff that is. Um, uh, Carefully sourced from from you know well-known distributions, which is that you can um, you should be able to to find out you know where your layers come from you know what what your what the packages were you know generated from where the source code is um, so that's uh, you know I, I hope that we are sort of transitioning uh, from the sort of uh, you know wild west kind of scenario that initially existed with some of these container registries towards a more um, a kind of like a marriage of the traditional uh, distribution, uh, GNU Linux distribution with, with uh, you know, the convenience of being able to create and then easily deploy containers.
Well, as Sam pointed out, right, that's because the users' rights were so important to the people making the distributions. They had a copyleft mindset, even when they weren't dealing with copylefted software. They were still thinking out of a mental framework in which it is the preservation of the users' rights, which is the raison d'etre for the way we handle the software, which isn't necessarily in tension with a developer's rights. I want to get my best software and put its best foot forward out into the world as quickly as possible. I am paid to make these workloads jump. But it's not necessarily consistent with that either. Um, what, what, what Sam said and what you were picking up on is that we can have technical best practices for doing that. And Sam says Debian needs to learn to get a little faster in the sense that it needs to deal with forms of distribution like Flatpak and Snap that, that may allow us to, to uh, uh, speed developers' interests, but we're still going to have to figure out how to subject all of that to the user's rights perspective, which is fundamental to our reason for existing. And you said, we're getting better at that because the people who happen to build the technology first in the world of containerization and mobile workloads and ultimately cloud-native computing, they, they began from a perspective which didn't necessarily take users' rights as seriously as the traditional distributions. Do I have you correct? Yeah, that's a good way to, to, to put it. So if that's right, then one part of what we can do is technical, as Sam is saying. We can, we, we can take comfort from the fact that our deep, warm friends and allies at Microsoft now own GitHub and they can do wonderful things to help developers who use it and they can create whole ranges of new autonomous processes for helping to cover these gaps. Are there things that we could do on the licensing side that would also help? I think, I mean, I think that's the big question, right, is that I think, so it's not that Debian necessarily needs to move faster, for example, to work with Slat, Snap and Flatpak. It's that I think there's a community question of helping people understand the value of an intermediary. Basically, in, in some real senses, Fedora or Debian actually audit um, license compliance and audit supply chain issues um, so that, and, and, and audit some quality issues. Um, and honestly, I think that even in a fast-paced world, that kind of auditing has value. And I think the, the interesting question is to figure out how to bring, using whatever technology you want, but figuring out how to bring that kind of third-party review into other processes. Uh, in a way that preserves user freedom is, in my mind, one of the big open questions in um, kind of free software distribution today. And I don't have answers. I'd like to start a conversation. I'd like to, to figure out, basically, the, thing, the, the one thing I've come up with is I think that having third parties in the mix helps. So one thing about about third parties in this uh, context, I'd like to say is, uh, so th there are these other intermediaries that have grown up um, kind of around the same time as the, the Linux distributions, uh, but some of them are sort of grew up later in time. Uh, they, they exist at a higher point in the, the kind of the stack uh, or the universe of, um, of free software code that I am kind of visualizing. So these are the language specific uh, upstream packaging systems that um, are out there uh, that are kind of uh, standing in, in between, in many cases, the, the, uh, the initial project, the original project, and the, you know, potentially uh, a distribution like Debian or, or Fedora or RHEL downstream. So these are, these are things like, like uh, you know, N NPM or um, uh, Maven Central. PyPy. Uh, PyPy, exactly. Yeah. Um, now the problem is that, so the, these, these have grown up in part because of uh, what I was saying earlier that the, the, the distributions um, uh, haven't been able to um, keep up with the demand for uh, packaging, you know, more and more 
software and more and more uh, versions of, so uh, of upstream software. Um, but the, um, the, the, the folks who are kind of developing uh, or maintaining those upstream uh, parallel package, package management systems that are sort of language or platform specific uh, don't have the same sort of tradition or culture of, of um, you know, care about licensing, you might say obsession with licensing and, and, and the, the tendency to, to want to audit that we see in the distribution world. And so I think that the challenge is how to kind of um, uh, transfer that, that sort of um, older distribution culture a little bit upstream to those language specific or platform specific um, package management systems. So, so actually I'd like to distinguish between two categories of intermediaries. I think you have intermediaries who are pro providing a platform uh, that's effectively an unmoderated platform, like GitHub. Um, and then you have intermediaries, like the distributions, that are actually kind of providing an auditing point. And, and I think a lot of the language-specific repositories look a lot closer to the first. Like, they're, they're, you know, they don't have a lot of requirements. Um, I don't know a lot of people who have, you know, who've not, who've had trouble getting their node package into NPM. Um, and I'm not sure, I, I, I don't, I, I don't know their cultures very well, but I think that may be intentional. And I'm not, and I actually think the community is served by having places where you can find the everything. Um, but I also think that finding a way for some of that second category of intermediary that, that does care about review might be valuable to the community. We think that law affects culture and culture affects law, so I want to try and put a finer point back on the question. Are there ways that we can use licensing itself to help people acquire the right culture? It doesn't seem to me entirely adventitious that most of those language communities you talk about are not standard or standardized around copyleft licensing. They like MITx and they like the Python license and they like other forms of licensing which are good for developers and highly flexible but may not require the kind of attention to the preservation of users' rights that copyleft licensing has done. Is there a way that we can use licensing itself to cause the conversation within communities of programmers to become more conscious of the preservation of users' rights? Can we make copyleft simpler or can we make permissive licensing more complex in some way that will help? Uh, do you have any specific examples? Well, I'm talking also to Richard, who is a license maker oh, and sure. who might have ideas of his own about that. Have your thoughts gone there? Uh, well, so I, I don't. I don't think that making permissive licensing more complicated is. See, it doesn't strike me as being a, a viable approach for, for cultural reasons, because. Uh, so, so you, because you said something, people use permissive, license, permissive licensing because they want to rock and roll. Well, and you, you, said, you said something very interesting, which is that these uh, these upstream intermediaries, the language specific intermediaries, uh, they, they see a lot of them at least seem to um, uh, uh, they, they, they they tend to be uh, uh, you, you, mini universes of packages that that um, look like they're more likely to be per, do, dominated by permissive licenses than copyleft licenses. Uh, I, I don't, you know, I don't know how much to make of that, but I think that that is connected in some way to the um, greater uh, informality and the, 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 um, the, 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 the less, um, the, the lower sort of adherence to a, a culture of, of uh, careful concern for some of the niceties of, of uh, license compliance. So, so, but, but this applies to uh, the permissive license stuff as well. So there are some, some of these upstream uh, packages that, that get put in these intermediaries. Uh, you know, something that, that I see from time to time is that, that the, the, whoever is kind of uploading it, you know, usually it's the, the original upstream project, but not always, um, will strip out license files, for example. Um, th this is something that, that happens. And, and um, that's regardless of whether it's uh, governed by the MIT license or, or you know, GPLv2 or, or, or what have you. Um, but, but, but one common feature of uh, almost all of these, these licenses, of course, is that, um, you know, bare minimum compliance, you have to uh, preserve uh, notice of what the, the original license was. And yet, um, the, the uh, packagers of, these, uh, of this software are, 
are actually stripping those out to make the, the um, packages more streamlined and simpler. And we see that in the container world, too. Um, so how do, you, how do you address that through licensing? I, I, don't, I don't really have a good answer to that. I have thought that um, on the copyleft side, um, you know, this, is, this obviously becomes, the compliance becomes more acute, I think, in, in, in a sense, than, than uh, on the permissive license side, uh, if only because the, the original licensors may, uh, maybe this is kind of a copyleft bias, but they may care less about, about compliance ultimately compared to um, the copyleft licensor. But how, do you, um, how do you use licensing to make sure that, um, you know, complete corresponding source code is available to the, to the user? Um, the only thing I can say is that maybe um, simplifying the requirements around what you do in that kind of situation to provide notice of where to get the source code is, is an answer. Like maybe there's a complexity to um, what the GPL, uh, GPLv2 or GPLv3 seem to require um, or allow uh, that that could be made more flexible um, to facilitate situations where, for example, the source code is actually widely available, but it is um, often some other, you know, distribution, or, or, or you know, you can, you can easily get it, but it's all public, but, but it's not going to be um, in this container registry necessarily. Um, I'm not sure that that's really a satisfactory long-term solution, but, but um, uh, you know, that, that's, that's one possibility. I, uh, my heart warms to it, but um, this may be the only room in the world where there will be people who will have questions about a conversation like this, and we should let them have them. People okay. want in? Sam, you want to say something more? No, no, no. I mean, we, you've, you've stuck us up here for people to throw fruit at us, you know, on these high seats. I mean, if people aren't <laughs> going to actually jump in, what's the point of all that? Um, I wanted to mention that the, um, the discussion about containerization actually even applies to end users now, containers which are not distributed at all. For example, um, prior to Debian Buster being released when I was still using Stretch, um, in order to use the most recent release of the CertBot tool, you had to install it from PyPI. You couldn't use the Stretch version because it was missing features that everybody wanted. So you then use the Python mechanism virtual and for those who care about that sort of thing to create an ad hoc container to install it into so you can get the most recent versions of the dependencies and not be stuck with the version that was available in the distribution. So this becomes even an issue just for even for end users, not just for people who are distributing things. The pace of the package development and release is so, so fast that there's, I don't think any team of moderators could actually keep up with that. And yet, the thing is that there are still people who value that moderation, right? That's, that is the big challenge I think we're all facing. Is like, if we decided that license compliance and avoiding malware weren't important, the solution's simple. Um, unfortunately, we kind of like those things. Hi, um, so I had a question because uh, I know Debian recently instated that um, new packages have to be reproducible, um, and I think that, That's, is, that is that true? Go on, go on with your question. Well, uh, you know, uh, this might be um, very naive, but do you guys foresee a world in which it is part of the license that not only do you have the source code, um, but that you know the, the 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 binaries that are released are reproducible, and thus you know that the source code actually corresponds to the binaries that you're releasing. Um, so, I'm trying to think about whether that would be DFS G free. That's fascinating. Um, wow. It could be because if you pass certain command arguments, you're going to get a different. So, well, no, but I mean, if you did pass the same with, the, with like, would would um, no, but I, let's say that um, if your license said that you had to have a license that, or had to have binaries that were reproducible given, you know, and you had to describe the build environment well enough that it was reproducible if you were going to distribute. Um, that seems like 
an awful burden to make an individual user face before giving a copy of a binary to a friend, honestly. Um, and yet, I'm not sure that it would be non-free in our, in our standpoint. Um, so to, to answer your specific question, um, Debian recently decided that we were not accepting binaries built on individual developers' machines. Um, reproducibility is something we're working towards, but it's, uh, and it's something we value strongly, um, but it is not a requirement. I just, I just want to add that would seemingly proscribe the use of non-deterministic compilers. I don't, I think that that would be effectively impossible without dramatically changing the landscape of developer tools. We haven't, no. not, it would not, yes, it would limit some things, but if you take a look at the reproducible builds process, a uh, project, uh, surprisingly, you. I think, doesn't the GPL already require complete and correspondence? Uh, forgive me, could you turn the microphone on in front of you? For a remote audience. The uh, speak icon, touch that. Ah. There you go. Thanks, apologies. Because the GPL requires complete and corresponding source code, it kind of is the mechanism that ensures that reproducible builds have a source code base to point to. So you kind of can't do this with proprietary software. So in a way, the, the freedom aspects of the GPL make reproducible builds possible because you have to have complete control over the, the not just the source code, but the tool chain. Uh, I mean, no, actually, there are proprietary systems that really do care about reproducibility. I, I, I mean, How can you do that? How can you do that without the source code? I mean, they, no, within their, within their environment, right? I mean, um, I, I, you know, you can't prove it's reproducible, but within um, within an environment where you have access to the source code, you can, uh, and that is absolutely important to some people in the proprietary space, and has been in some ways longer than it has been important to the free software community. Go ahead, Jim. I really do want to know what Oracle thinks about this. This is important. <laughs> Oracle is not here today. Uh -huh. <laughs> but Jim Wright, then Jim Wright, <laughs> speaking for himself, what do you think? I mean, if your compiler just uses a, you know, has a seed based on the build machine, right? a non-deterministic compiler makes this literally, you know, theoretically not possible. So I, I think you would... So, and, and that's why... We're well, and, and I, I think what we... So the reproducible builds community has said we, we have found that the value of reproducible builds is such that... Um, if you're com that we expect your compiler to be able to load a seed if it's going to have one. And the number of cases where we found that the value to a particular software package was high enough um, to, that we were willing to make an exception for the non-determinism is remarkably low. I think, we ought to, I think we ought to understand that there are many different elements in the user's right to have the source code at which at one end of the spectrum of which is the right to reproduce exactly the bytes in the binary from exactly the source code provided. But that's a particular view of the user's right at a particular moment. The primary user's right is to learn from the software, the, to know what the ideas are that the software represents, and to be able to use those ideas both in situ and to move those ideas somewhere else and instantiate them in other software inventions. For which purpose, after all, we never interpreted the GPL to say that you had to have an interpreter, for example, for the source code you were given. We always held that the GPL was satisfied if you got the source code of an interpreted program, even if you didn't have access to the interpreter that was running the particular binary. Uh. Because what we were preserving was the user's right to learn. That doesn't mean that in every circumstance that would be perfectly acceptable. And as Sam is pointing out, what really comes to bear is an exception condition. The general proposition is you need exactly the source code from which the thing was built, 
and enough of the scripts and tools that it is theoretically possible for a technically sophisticated person to build the binary received from the source code given. And as Sam said, if you want to have any control over malware, you pretty much have to have that much. Because if you can't actually be sure that the source code you have studied is the binary that's running, then the security consequences of the user's rights have vanished altogether. But there is some limit at which the question, whether it is the non-deterministic compiler or the presence of odd machine architectures for which we are maintaining code museums. Or, or, signer, or signatures, right? I mean, I don't necessarily, with, with the, the consumer, um, provision of the GPL3 notwithstanding, there are many licenses, even copyleft licenses, that don't actually guarantee that I'm able to produce a signed binary. Yes. And, and only some circumstances, even under GPL3, in which that ability to produce a signed binary is relevant. Uh, uh, McCoy will remember how much time we spent yes. on that little matter. Um, so, so let us ask then just one last question, which part of this friction over trust, because it is a friction over trust, who do we trust to make the software, what do we trust them to have checked, how do we choose to rely on people, which part of this trust friction is the part we're trying to preserve, and which part is the part we would like to get rid of in order to make things easier for people. From my point of view, the compromises represented by GPL2 and GPL3 are still basically 20th century compromises. We need source code to be available in files you can get on media usually used for software exchange. And we loosened that in GPL3 in ways that we thought were appropriate to the first decade of the 21st century, but may not be appropriate to the second or the third. Are we imposing in our most user-respecting licenses, frictions that we ought now to be, considered, to be considering lifting. Are there ways to simplify copyleft which will produce a better cultural compromise? More respect for users' rights in return for more ease of application and deployment for programmers who want, for perfectly legitimate reasons, technical and economic, to move as fast as they can and to deliver, as you point out, as lightly as they can, as small, as fast, as minified, as easy for the user to run on the great big utility computing platforms of now. Sure, are there things we should be lifting? Restrictions we should be getting rid of? I don't think so. Unfortunately, I think that if you actually want those user freedoms, you kind of need all those things. Like, the problems with GPL compliance are like actually checking things that kind of do matter, like do you actually have source code to the dependencies? Did you actually provide the build scripts? And you can talk about how nice it would be to lift those, except like the users kind of do care. Um, I'll say that you know an area where we could make things easier for people who choose to use the AGPL, um, enforcing this sort of like managing to distribute the right version of the source code of an AGPL work if you've made changes is actually really hard for most works. Um, but in most other areas, if we actually care about these freedoms, I think the restrictions are still important. Anybody else want to talk about this? I think this is a big conversation for the future. Maybe we are done with it today. Richard, you want a last word? Yeah, I mean, I, I just think that um, um, the, the, the overall policies that are implemented in the licenses we have today are are appropriate. Uh, I don't think that means that we have to have, for example, the set of allowed modes of distributing corresponding source code that GPLv3 authorizes. There could be various relaxations of it. This is part of what I guess was envisioned by the uh, you know possibility of additional permissions. But but. Um, um, I think the direction we should probably be going in if we think about um, simplifying copyleft is is pointing to to those kinds of simplifications. So so um, making it easier, not more difficult for um, uh, you know developers, um, uh, providers of of packaged images to comply with um, source code requirements and and other license other free software license requirements rather than uh, imposing a more, um, like a stricter regime than we currently have.
Completely agree. And let us leave it there for at least a couple of hours. Thank you very much.